Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Welcome to Speak Up. I'm Kevin Avard, representative here in Nashville, New Hampshire, and today I'm going to be interviewing Josh Youssef, a GOP nominee for District 7 uh, for the Senate seat up in the Laconia area. Uh, Laconia District. That's right. The, the new district area. That's right. And uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks I appreciate for having you coming me. on. I appreciate it. Now, you've been on the show uh, before, but uh, today we're going to just talk a little bit about Josh Youssef. Uh, not too much on issues just yet, but I, I uh, discovered some things about you that I think that are important to talk about. And one of them is, first of all, Youssef. Everybody <laughs> thinks of what kind of name is Youssef? Sure. It's, uh, it's Egyptian. My dad is uh, right from Egypt. He was uh, born and raised in Egypt, and at the age of 26, in the uh, mid to late 60s, he moved um, over to the States, and he was uh, in search of a better life. In search of a better life, what do you mean? Well, my dad is a, uh, he's a Coptic Orthodox Christian, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, it, he represents a minority in the Middle East. Okay. And, there's a lot of persecution and what have you um, by radical Islamic groups of conservative Christians. And right. so there was that factor. And also my dad was uh, very well educated. Um, he's a retired professor, um, 25 years. He's taught school uh, for another 15 years before that. And he knew that there was a better life right. to be had over in America. Was he teaching in Egypt? He was, yes. Okay. He was teaching in Egypt. and. He is a, a big thinker, and he is a very inspired and motivated man. And he knew that there was an opportunity to be had in America that could not be attained in the Middle East. Now, when you say he was a Coptic Christian in a minority, was he suffering any kind of persecution there as a minority? Yeah, you know, I... I've talked with him extensively about it, and it's um, it's a subject that it's it's a difficult subject because clearly he you know he he's very he's very faithful uh, man. In fact, his grandfather was um, very high up in the Coptic Church, and it's it's very similar to Catholicism in a way. They have a, a papal structure, mm -hmm. and his grandfather was a a papal um, official. I think he might have been like the second or third. So you have a long line of, of, of Christianity of some sort or of, of resemblance of Christianity. In fact, you, you mentioned the last name. The last name um, is translated as Joseph. Oh. Yeah. So. Oh, jo Joseph of e oh, No yeah. way. So that's, that's where that comes from. Interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. Okay, so he, he immigrated to, to America. Yep. And uh, not too much money in his pocket. Yeah, he actually, um, it's, it's really a terrific story. It's a story that I've told many times because it's, it's very inspirational to, to me and to the people I share it with. He left, and he was only able to leave with $147 in his pocket. Now, of course, $147 40-some-odd years ago is more than it's worth today, but right. still, nonetheless, it's a lot. Uh, it's, it's not that much money, should I say, to leave not Everything. only your country but your continent not speaking the language, um, not having any security as to a job when you get to the other side. Not even knowing if you can communicate with people on the other side. So he left with 147 bucks, and when he got here, he had a, a great education. He was a very well um, respected and accomplished uh, educator. What, what did he teach? What was his, uh, his? Physics, chemistry, and advanced maths. Wow. And so he, he, certainly, uh, he certainly has his, his uh, head about him. Right. And, and so when he got here, he realized, my goodness, um, this is going uh, to be quite a fight. So he was driven to obtain, uh, to attain the goals that he had 
set his, so long ago. His brothers came with him as well? Or? They came um, scattered over a period of a couple of years. So um, his older brother and then his uh, next older brother uh, came in a, six, a series of uh, three or four successive years. So, so when he got here, he uh, determined that hard work, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Right. <laughs> and so as a result, he, um, can, he continued his education. He went to Tufts University. This was already after having um, you know, had quite an education behind him. And then he also um, worked a couple of jobs. So we're talking sleeping four or five hours a night and working and going to school the rest of the time. And he's told me many stories about how he had to conserve every little tiny thing. Paper towels, he'd have to be very conservative with them because he didn't know where his next roll of paper towels was coming from. Right. He didn't know, you know where his next tube of toothpaste was coming from. And so I guess the essence of conservatism is born um, of a need to conserve. Yeah, out of necessity. Out right. of necessity. Yeah. And so essentially um, he, he maintained those ideals while not deviating from a, uh, an inspiration to work really, really hard. Did he move to New Hampshire right away, or was it? Uh... He came um, originally to Toronto, okay. and he spent a very short amount of time there. And then he um, was hired as a teacher in uh, in the Concord area. Okay. And so he Pembroke Academy, I believe it was. And so he taught there for a while, and then he got a job at Laconia High School as a science teacher. Oh. And so that uh, was in the middle, or no, the middle to early to mid seventies, I believe it was. And of course, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> right. But uh, he bought his uh, first business, which was a, a smaller um, dock and marine business in the mid-70s. And he worked hard, and he built the business, and built the business, and built the business. And it's been rewarded for his hard work. And now he's proud, and we're all proud, of his accomplishments. He employs people. And this is a you know foreigner. He comes from another another land. Right. Now he's providing um, jobs for Americans. He's, he's educated. Them. He's educated them. He has um, you know, he owns uh, properties, you know, housing properties, and he provides homes for Americans. And you know, I just look at it and I stand back and I say, Wow, that's the American he dream. had the deck stacked against him. Right, one hundred and forty-seven dollars, and he turned that through hard work determination, and a system that afforded him the, the ability to, to practice his, his dream and turn it into a reality. No government handouts? Absolutely never. Right. Interesting. Never. Never. And so he's the quintessential small business owner living the American dream. That's exactly right. In the mid-90s, um, he obtained his citizenship. Maybe it was the early 90s. I don't know the date. I think it was probably 93, 94. And he is the, the ultimate American, really. Right. He is the ultimate American. And you know, we're all very proud of what he's accomplished, and we're very thankful for what he's passed down to us. And um, So when do you come on the scene? I came on the scene in 1976. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> That's the spirit. 1976. And I, I was supposed spirit to be born on July 4th, but uh, mm. you know, I, I waited until July 15th. I, <laughs> it's, it's, there was, there was, uh, there's enough going on on July 4th, and so... Interesting. So you're, 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 you come along, you've got some siblings as well. Um, that's right. And uh, you're growing up in the Laconia area. That's right. I was born and raised in Laconia. Where did you go to school? I went to school at Laconia High School, and after graduating Laconia High, I went to Syracuse University for a year, and I studied computer engineering. And computer engineering uh, wasn't exactly the precise discipline that I was interested in pursuing, and so I went to UNH, um, and I also didn't really like being outside of the state. I didn't like New York. I didn't like, as cold as we think it is in New Hampshire in the winter, it is a whole lot colder up right, in Syracuse. Right. right. So, Flatland, right? Yeah, it's yeah. upstate New York, yeah. and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a difficult place when you're 18 years old. Right. Uh, it's not going around. <laughs> yeah, being holed up in, uh, in a punk. freezing yeah. cold dorm room all winter, it's, it's a difficult place. But, mm. Um, so I, I actually uh, went to UNH for a year. And in the middle of my second year of school, which was my first year at UNH, where I was studying computer science, which is really the discipline of building and architecting software systems um, from the software side, not the hardware side, right. which is really where my passion and my, my, uh, my skill uh, is, is derived from is, uh, is that year. 
But I, um, in the middle of that year, I had a few um, people, faculty, staff members, students that were interested in computer services, and they knew that I was pretty handy with a computer. And so I turned this hobby into a business out of my dorm room. It was actually a small apartment. It really wasn't a dorm. Right. And got to a, it, we grew the business to a place where it was, we couldn't operate out of an apartment anymore. And <laughs> it was just uh, having customers come into my little apartment with my bed over in the corner just didn't make sense. And so I, had, I was faced with a difficult decision. I said, do I go back to school or do I keep um, nurturing and building this business? And I chose the latter. So I decided I wasn't going to go back to school and I would take a year off and see how things materialize with the business. And uh, I guess it was kind of a repeat of my dad's experience. <laughs> right. So the hard work was paying off. I worked hard. I worked late. I worked seven days a week. I had customers that had demands, and I had to meet those demands. Did you get any government grants to help you with your business? Nothing. In fact, I started literally with zero dollars, and I had to devise a business model that would um, be able to grow on a shoestring. And the way I did that was providing... Um, services, predominantly services, and then we slowly got into hardware. And of course, we built the business by um, investing heavily in infrastructure and um, the systems that go into building a, a, a computer business. Mm -hmm. And um, again, the, the business was taking off and things were going very well. And then I was uh, met with a proposal to start a software company to build software systems for Fortune 500 companies that were working um, in trade shows. So, so somebody was noticing what you're doing here. Obviously. Yeah, it, it was it was gaining some gaining some traction, gaining some speed, mm -hmm. and so we built some really neat state of the art systems that were at the time uh, were unpioneered technologies to qualify and quantify the value of a um, of an exhibitor like IBM or Sun Microsystems at the time or Compaq Computer. Right. Um, attending and spending all this money at trade shows. And so that was a, a really awesome opportunity. I was traveling a lot of all over the country and meeting a lot of great people, and of course, uh, building my business. And then unfortunately, 9-11 um, came. Mm -hmm. And it came out of nowhere, like it did for all of us. Nobody expected this. And it really took a devastating toll on the trade show business. So that was a, a, an uncontrollable circumstance, which really caused my business to suffer. And so you had to adjust to? We had to adjust and make adjustments to our business model and accommodate for this dr drastic and sharp, um, you know. Is it because people weren't traveling? They were afraid of traveling at exactly. that point? Exactly. People weren't traveling. They mm -hmm. weren't going to trade shows. The attendance was down. Therefore, the money being spent at the trade shows was a fraction of what it was. My service was kind of a premium service that we provided to a lot of the bigger companies whose budgets needed to get cut immediately. Right. And so Obviously. one of our, ser our, our prime service, our cyber cafe service and our lead generation service just kind of evaporated, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And like you said, we had to make serious adjustments to the business model. So I went back in 2003 to a model or to parts of the business model that I had originally um, employed in my first business, the business that I started in my, in my college apartment. And we worked hard. It was based on a really a, a unique idea that we would provide computer repair and upgrade services the very same day that the customer brought it in. And of course, as people's needs for computers um, it increased and customers had a, more of a dependency on their computers, it made it very difficult, and it continues to this day, to be very difficult to be without your computer for any length of time. Right. So the idea caught, um, caught some, the attention of a lot of people, home users, business users alike. And as a result, um, this company, my latest company from 2003, was born Same Day Computer. So you basically know how to grow a business. Yeah, starting I've, I've started with, them. With what you know. And, and, and developing it, you, 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 what surprised me is the fact that you said you developed a business plan. You knew that you needed the business plan, mm -hmm. which shows an acumen, which I thought was rather interesting. I've been in business for 26 years and uh, oh. uh, sole proprietor, but developing yeah. a business plan wasn't really one of my, my, my expertise. You, you had the wisdom enough to, to do that. 
Well, I knew I needed a roadmap. Right. I needed to be able to have something in front of me. Right. And, you know, I, I, it's not etched in granite. And it, it was, it's part of it's on a napkin and part of it's on a uh, this scrap piece of paper that I found on the dining yeah. room table or what have you. But uh, the reality is, is that I had to have a roadmap because I know that in order to weather a, a series of economic storms that I would encounter over the past, you know, whatever, 18 years or so, right. I, I knew that I needed to stay the course and I knew that I needed to have a system that would absorb as much of the shock of a bad economy and enjoy as much of the fruits of a good economy as possible. And the way that this was accomplished is by being conservative, being very, very um, conservative with resources, being creative, being able to think outside of the box, being able to solve problems with limited resources. Which is my segue. Okay. <laughs> now you're running for Senate. Yes. Here in New Hampshire. Why? What's driving you to run for Senate? You're young. What, what, you can, you, can uh, you know, the apple, you know, the state's your oyster or whatever. The, the sky's the limit. Yeah. Um, what's driving you to, to run for Senate? Sure. That's a great question. And if I could speak to, it's kind of a two-part answer. And the, if I could speak to what you first said. A lot of people are asking me that same question. And they said, you've got this great business and you're, you could expand your business and open more locations. Uh, we have locations all across New Hampshire now and we're continuing to expand. And people say, well, why don't you just invest this time? You know, you're 36 years old, you're full of energy, you're full of great ideas, the timing is perfect. And I said, that's why I'm running for the Senate. Because I'm 36, I've got great ideas and the timing is perfect. And New Hampshire needs the ideals and the ideas that I espouse. Um, I am somebody who has the understanding and the temperance and I like to think the experience over time to be able to solve New Hampshire's critical problems. Now, we need jobs. That's one We of need jobs. We need to stimulate the economy. And when I say stimula stimulate the economy, we need to create policies that are friendly to businesses. We need to make it easy to start and operate and expand and grow your business in New Hampshire. New Hampshire needs to be a place that people from the outside look at and say, I want to do business there. One of the biggest complaints we're hearing about, Josh, is, is, is the fact that New Hampshire is so overregulated. Yes. Uh, it's come to our detention that, that in some respects it's as regulated as California. And when I first heard that, I, I was kind of taken back. And, mm -hmm. and, but as time goes on, it, it, it's definitely true. And of course, the tax structure is another situation where you know, we're looking at this business profit tax or yes. BET tax, whatever yep. it is. BET, BPT. And um, that's a, a deterrent for people to come here and, and, and grow their business. Agreed. Another issue, and I'm throwing these at you. Sure. Um, the workforce. Mm. Uh, some of the manufacturers, now you're not necessarily in the manufacturing no, we're not. end of this, but some of the manufacturers are saying, listen, they're, they're, they're moving out of here because we don't have a workforce ready. That's right. A, a ready workforce. Kids are graduating from school expecting them to go to college. They don't go to college, but that's what the schools were designing them to, exactly. to go to college, yet man, there are great manufacturing jobs out there. That's right. And they're not ready to get into it because they can't do the simple math. That's exactly right. And we have a, that, that leads me directly into um, one of the other areas that's very important to me is education reform. We have a broken education system, and it is in dire need of attention, and it needs it now. Now, you know the teachers are going to be going, that is a big red flag. It, it, this is not an indictment against the teachers. No, my dad's a teacher. Right. My dad was a teacher for 40, 40 right. plus years. And, you know, people that educate people are the people who determine how our future right. is going to be um, played out. And so education, and we need lots of different types of education. We don't need a one-size-fits-all education solution. We need an education solution that is tailored to each individual student. And choice. Choice. Education choice. And the last legislature was very successful in passing House Bill 1607 and Senate Bill 372. And it was an amazing step in the right direction. That's a, a step that allows businesses to apply um, a large percentage of the um, tax that they would otherwise owe to the state to a scholarship fund to allow 
children to right. obtain an education in an environment, a setting, in a school that is most befitting of their learning style? Tailor-made. Tailor-made. Right. And like you said, it's certainly not an <clears throat> indictment against teachers or any one particular um, type of schooling, but I'm, as you can appreciate, uh, very much uh, pro-homeschooling, pro-charter school, pro-private school. And I believe that in a free market, just like in the business world, a free market forces competition. And when competition exists, the price goes down and the quality goes up. It's a, it's a natural market um, regulation. It really is a win-win for everybody because a win -win. it does build up some competition. It, it, uh, it helps, it serves the people because that's, after all, what education is there for. It's there to serve the people. That's exactly to right. Educate the children who will be <clears throat> fruitful in their environment. That's exactly right. Well, I, I'm running out of time right now. Um, for Maybe you can come on the show at another time and talk sure. uh, about some other issues. I wanted to get a little background on you because uh, people are, are asking and they want to know. And, you know, listen, we, we live in a time where people are, are, are afraid of names. There's a xenophobia that goes on. And when they hear the, the name Yusef, they go, oh, my gosh, what, what, <laughs> what do we got here? And I, I wanted to clear the air on that. And I, hey, and, I appreciate that. And I think you did. And, and I, think I was born and raised in Laconia, New Hampshire. Right. I, I am a, a Laconia boy, a native of New Hampshire. Right. And, uh, and New Hampshire is the, the place that I want to see remain great. Small business owner, yes. entrepreneur, yes. Uh, and... Uh, Obviously, conservative Republican. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and uh, definitely liberty minded. I know that, that uh, on other issues. Well, I want to close this segment. Is there any final thoughts that you want to give the, the, our, our viewers? I also want you, the people to know that uh, if you want to support your campaign, here, here's uh, the information that you need. How, how do you do that? Sure. Our website is located at www.josh4nh.com, and that's spelled out J, J O S H F O R N H.com. Uh, you could email us at info at josh4nh or me personally at josh at josh4nh.com. Or you could call the campaign office at 603-707-2331. Mm -hmm. And in closing, I'd just like to um, also just finish off two very, very important subjects that, and I won't go into detail on them, but um, two other things that are very important to me that are going to be key components of my legislative agenda are health care reform and property tax relief. There are two areas that are absolutely, they're a millstone around the necks of the people of New Hampshire. We need to provide relief in those areas. We need to get quality coverage for people, as many people as possible, and we need to use the free market. The free market is asking us to please, please utilize us. Utilize us so that we can bring the quality up and the cost down, so we can provide care and coverage to the sick, the needy, um, the poor, to, to everybody, and there's a way to do it without increasing taxes. And the second thing is property tax relief. We're deterring um, people from moving here. We're taxing lifelong residents and people who have inheritances, who have grown up in homes. We're taxing them off their property. We're taxing them off their farms. We're taxing them out of their parents' homes. We are putting people in um, managed care facilities because they can't afford their own homes. And we need to provide relief. We're deterring would-be um, budding entrepreneurs from coming to the state, putting a manufacturing facility here, putting a store, putting a retail operation, because the cost of owning property in New Hampshire is just out of control. Well, with that, we're gonna we'll we'll uh, have you come on another time and, and talk about this. And uh, really good luck with the campaign, and Thank uh, you, I hope you do well. And thanks for uh, watching. Speak up. And if you want to support the show, become a sponsor, please contact me, uh, Kevin Evard, at speakupnh at gmail.com or email me uh, at, at that at, at speakupnh at gmail.com or, or mail me, I'm, I, the snail mail, hello, uh, at 68 Bartimus Trail, Nashua, New Hampshire, 03063. And thank you very much. Every day, Citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedoms, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list 
goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back.